want to say thank you for your loving kindness towards us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together on this day when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that you teach us what you want us to know and learn through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, good morning and praise the Lord. Thank you very much for coming to celebrate this Pentecost Sunday. We cannot take it for granted, but God is always merciful. Even when Satan wants to disorganize us, God is always on our side. When the chaplain asked me to preach on June 5th, that's when my eye gave up. But by God's grace, I went for surgery a week ago, and today I'm trying to test whether it, it, it can work. But I think <laughs> it is working because I can see all the corners. I want to say that Pentecost is a significant event in the life of the church and in the life of us individuals and other ecclesial communities. At Pentecost, we declare that God who is Father, God who is Son, God who is the Holy Spirit is forever present in his church and among us in a unique and a mysterious way. This morning, I want to do two things. Number one, try to narrate what happened on that day when the 120 disciples were gathered together in one room. And two, state why it matters for us Christians to observe the Pentecost Sunday. But first let me put Pentecost in its historical context. You see, there are so many things which we find in the Bible and which we celebrate which were not originally religious at all. And one of them is Pentecost. Pentecost was originally an agricultural festival. It marked the first harvest of the growing season. But on the Jewish spiritual calendar, it marked the 50th day after the Passover feast. And the Passover feast was always celebrated in remembrance of what happened to the children of Israel a day prior the day they left Egypt. This is the day when the angel of death spared the firstborn of the children of Israelites and killed the firstborn of the Africans in Egypt. But let us go back to our theme. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, his mission was not fully done. Why? Because he had not given the greatest gift of all, and that is the gift of his Holy Spirit. This gift of the Holy Spirit was to lead his disciples into his righteousness. And this happened on the 50th day after the Passover feast. And it is because of this reality that today we are focusing on the story of the Pentecost as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, and then 14 through 22, as has been read to us. Pentecost was a very big festival for the Jews, because many of them coming from all corners of the Roman Empire would gather in Jerusalem once every year to celebrate the Pentecost feast. But to understand what happened on this first day of the Pentecost, we want to go back to 
Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 15, where we are told that about 120 people were together, gathered in one place, when God visited them with the gospel. And the gospel simply meaning the good news. But in the case of the disciples, they still had only partial of understanding what was going on. They were a bit confused because they had high hopes in Jesus Christ's ministry, but which seemingly had been shattered. For example, they had followed Jesus Christ and loved him dearly. But they found themselves watching him die on the cross. And not a simple death, but a miserable death. They had rejoiced at his resurrection because he could reach them anywhere, anytime. And they thought, aha, at least now, even if he was, <laughs> he was killed, now he's with us in a different form. Unfortunately, they witnessed his ascension. All their hopes were gone. They were gone. But at this time, they were beginning to come to terms with the end of all their hopes. The frightened disciples were all together in one place, locked away in anxiety because they didn't see the future. They were excited. There was some kind of excitement, which was not really a positive aspect of their life, but a negative one, because fear and frustration had engulfed them. So they were waiting until the lockdown was lifted. And when I'm talking about lockdown, we Ugandans know what it means to be locked down for two years. So we want to ask ourselves, what was going on in the minds of these locked up disciples? You and I can only guess two things. Number one, they were trying to figure out what actually Jesus meant when he told them that they would tell this story about him beginning in Jerusalem, going to Judea, then Samaria, and they also expected to cover the entire world, including Uganda and Mukono, where we are. So they were saying, what does this mean? What did Jesus Christ mean now that he's not with us? The second guess, they were feeling overwhelmed by the assignment Jesus had given them. And they were asking themselves, when will this situation change for the better? When will it change for the better? And how shall we know that actually it has changed for the better? What kind of sign shall we have? Now, the answers to their questions are found in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, where we have three primary signs. The first one we are told, a strange sound like that of a violent wind filled the entire room where they were gathered together. This sound called attention of the entire population, including those who were in Jerusalem. People from language groups scattered throughout the ancient world came together to see what was happening when this sound took place. Unlike the sound of violent wind they were used to, and which we ourselves are used to, which destroys things, the Pentecost sound puts things together. The Pentecost sound 
brings light out of darkness. Put things together. Remember they were all together in this one room and now their fellowship was strengthened. They were in total darkness. Now they started to see some kind of light. The Pentecost sound brings order out of chaos. As we shall see, there was a sermon which brought the minds of the people together. It creates life out of death. Why? Because it is a heavenly sound, unlike the earthly sound which destroys things. The second sign, we are told that they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire resting on each and every one who was in that room. They visibly saw the flame. Now, during their time, the presence of God would be announced by fire. So fire was the sign of God's presence. So the spirit of God himself rested on these 120 disciples. Thirdly, they were empowered to do amazing things. All the disciples, we are told, began speaking languages they had never learned. When this sound occurred, the crowd came together from all corners of Jerusalem. Not because of the people speaking in tongues, no. They came because of the loud sound. They said, brothers and sisters, let us rush there to see what is happening. The Spirit had empowered the disciples to address the people in their own languages, not just for the sake of it, but that they could understand the gospel in their own languages. People who gathered outside the house were amazed because they had their own languages being spoken by people who came from Galilee. And they were asking, how is it that I hear in my own language? This was the question. This experience is not the experience of the people who come from the western part of this country and they have the language called Runyakitara. Where Munyore, Mtore, Mchiga, and Munyankole, when they are all together, they can speak without any translator. No, it is quite different. It is not Runyakitara for those of you who come from that end. No, these were strange languages altogether. Now, some of you might be asking, quietly as good Christians, especially Anglicans, do because they don't ask in open. Why did the 120 people speak different languages if God wanted the crowd to fully understand what was being said? Why did God not make the disciples speak only one language, which would be understood by the crowd. Now, the answer is that Pentecost is not a miracle of speaking in tongues as most of us believe. No, it is not a miracle of speaking in tongues. It is a miracle of learning. When you learn, then you understand. But you can only understand when you listen. So Pentecost is not a miracle of speaking tongues. It is a miracle of hearing, a miracle of understanding, and a miracle of listening. Now, the miracle of Pentecost challenges many of us, especially in our modern ch church, who strain to shout out our views at others, but never take time to listen to God's voice. You are very good at shouting at others with the gospel 
I'm always challenged by people in, in, in Kampala on the streets, shouting at others, and then I'm wondering, when would they ever listen to the word of God? Secondly, the miracle of Pentecost encourages us to listen to people who speak differently. This means that this miracle enables us to celebrate differences. Differences are very good if we don't misuse them. If we were all the same, either with black complexion or brown complexion, short or tall, the world would be very ugly. But the world is very beautiful because of the differences. We Ugandans know that our languages mark the boundaries between different cultures. See, mark various ways of understanding the world around us. But Pentecost, brothers and sisters, reminds us Christians that from that day, we crossed the boundaries that separate us. We crossed the boundaries that separate us. Even if you have a sentence name like mine, and therefore you can tell where you come from, and you have a name which is either has two letters or three, and I know where you come from, that does not matter in the sight of God. No. Pentecost reminds us that from that day we crossed boundaries that separate us, not by force of argument to prove that we are who we are because of this, but through the generous act of hearing and listening. If we Ugandans were to spend more time in hearing and listening, Uganda would be a very good place where to live. See? Would be a very good place where to live. So, Pentecost Sunday reminds us that we need to have more time in hearing and listening. Which means that God does not call us to speak in the same way, to act in the same way, to behave in the same way. No. Pentecost tells us that everyone is welcome. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Whatever language you speak, wherever you come from, whatever your story is, whether short or long, you are welcome to the kingdom of God. At Pentecost, Christians enter the language world of others so that they might articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ in terms that could be heard and understood by others. This is why God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This is not just a few people, but all people. God wants to open the flat gates of heaven upon all of us. God will empower us and give us what we need for ministry. And most of us, when we hear of being empowered for ministry, we immediately think of someone who is impossible to argue with theologically, people who are theologians and who can argue their theology in a very difficult manner. This is not what Jesus needs from us, brothers and sisters. Jesus needs ordinary men and women because ministry is for ordinary people, not very complicated people. See, not complicated people who teach systematic theology or who, who, who teach 
hermeneutics. No, God is interested in ordinary men and women because ministry is for ordinary people who share God's good news in their own way. Who share God's salvation story with others in their own way. Who behave as people of hope but not frustration. God does not discriminate when it comes to empowering men and women for his ministry. He will empower women, he will empower men, he will empower children. And I want to remind you that God empowered even Peter. You remember Peter? How many times did he deny Jesus Christ? Theologically, I want to be on the safe side by saying that he denied him more than once. See? More than once. I suspect God would have also empowered Judas if he had not taken his life. See? He would have empowered Judas if he had not taken his life. God wants men and women for his ministry. But who is that empowered Christian? The empowered Christian is the one who is filled with the Holy Spirit. So is there a sign that what someone is filled with the Holy Spirit which we can look at? The answer is yes. There will be always an evidence of power in one's life because Jesus Christ himself said, you receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, our definition of the power of the Holy Spirit has been distorted today. It has been distorted today because we believe that one who is empowered, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, is the one who has prolonged alleluias, is the one who has uncoordinated praise the Lord. That means applying praise the Lord when it is not necessary. I'll give you an example. In one of the parts of this country, which I will not mention because some of my students are here, I attended a service when, where one of them was preaching. And as you know, you want to tell people where God found you, where Jesus found you, and where you are now. So, in all the words he said, he ended by saying that actually I was a thief because I was always stealing from my parents, praise the Lord, and he sat down. Now, I was wondering whether he was praising the Lord because he was a thief, or he would have continued by saying, but now I'm a changed person, praise the Lord. Uncoordinated, praise the what? Now, I want to say that intense religious feelings are not a guarantee that someone is exercising the power of the Holy Spirit. It might be something else altogether. But the power of the Holy Spirit has to do with the ability to be what we were created to be. We were created to be men and women who are in the image of God. We were created to be children of God and not children of hell. No, we are created to be children of God. The power of the Holy Spirit has to do with the ability to touch people with the love of Jesus Christ. At times, some of us are not good examples, and therefore, we end leading our brothers and sisters into temptation of not coming to the Lord. One dad was very frustrated when he was told by his son, his dear son, whom he used to preach to, 
and he wanted him to come to the Lord. Then he asked, but when will you get saved? So the answer from this boy was very simple. He said, I will get saved when the saved people get saved. The dad was very, very frustrated and confused. Now, the power of the Holy Spirit has to do with touching people with the love of Jesus Christ and also reaching out with the healing life of Christ. This means that the power we get is not the power to manipulate other people. No, it is not that kind of power which we have to use to manipulate other people so that we can get what we want. No, that is not the power of the Holy Spirit. Rather, it is a gift from God to bless God's people. The Spirit being God's gift to us means two things. Number one, we cannot generate the Holy Spirit. We cannot own the Holy Spirit. We cannot control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves where it wills. Secondly, the Spirit given by God can also be removed by God. When this happens, we become the noisy gong. So pray with me that the Holy Spirit, as a gift of God, does not depart from you, does not depart from us. Otherwise, we shall become noisy gongs. Now, God chose to call people together on this day of Pentecost through a sound. Now my question is, do we still hear this kind of sound calling us in God's church? Do we see fire of salvation on our heads? Someone has said not anymore. Perhaps what we want today is not more sound not fire, but more prayer and more faith. At Pentecost, some people made fun of the disciples' behavior and accused them of having a little more of the Uganda spirit. Do you know the Uganda spirit? Waragi. But in this case, it was wine. So they accused them of having a little more wine. But my interpretation, brothers and sisters, of these people's behavior is that they were completely spirit-filled and they were exercising that power of the spirit. And this is why Peter stood up and answered the accusers with a sermon taken from Prophet Joel that prophesied the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to each and every one. But remember, Jesus had said days before that, this is what he had said, that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And weeks before that, he had said, it's necessary that I go away or else the comforter won't come. And the night following Jesus' resurrection, he met the disciples in the upper room and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, when the Holy Spirit shows up in one's life, he takes on the role of an advocate. Being a theologian and not a lawyer, the little I know about an advocate is that person who speaks on behalf of the others, especially when you are stuck with a case want to ask, is the spirit still doing its role in your life? Is the spirit still active? I want to say that the spirit is still active among his people as an advocate. How? 
by revealing Christ and bringing us salvation. And this is how Martin Luther put it. Say the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the true faith. Now, having elaborated on what happened on that day and why we should keep this Pentecost day, we want to come to a summary and get two or three lessons we can learn from the Pentecost message. I want to begin by saying that like the disciples before Pentecost, we Christians are called to wait. We are called to wait. That is what should characterize us, wait. Even after God had intervened so powerfully in their lives, the disciples still had to wait on God. In most cases, we want shortcuts. But someone has said that shortcuts usually cut spiritual life short. So, so be careful of shortcuts in the spiritual realm. We need to wait. On this side of heaven, we should never stop doing, doing that, the act of waiting. We are called to wait, brothers and sisters, but actively engaging ourselves in prophetic witness to demonstrate that actually God is good. Two, we must long for the power of the Holy Spirit. We usually do very well as a church, very well as a church, but when it comes to individual lives, that's where we score the lowest. Why? Because we cling to our comfort zones, detesting any intrusion of the Holy Spirit. But we have to remember, brothers and sisters, that the path to the glorious gift of the Holy Spirit passes through the cross. Remember the cross? The cross had, had thorns. The cross had nails. The cross had blood coming out of Jesus Christ. So that's where we pass. And at times, when we pass through the cross, our hopes are disappointed and our comfort zones are disrupted and our faith severely tested. We must long for the power of the Holy Spirit. Three, if we long for the power of the Holy Spirit, then we must be ready to be spirit-filled. At Pentecost, the disciples were ready to receive the Holy Spirit. And this was as a result of their readiness. In order to fulfill the mission for which we have been called, we must be spirit-filled. Lastly, we must long for the Spirit to manifest himself at specific times for specific missions or purposes. Let us avoid the temptation of thinking that spirit filled is a once filled, always filled experience. No. Remember, the disciples had already received the Holy Spirit, but still there was much they didn't understand. And this would happen at Pentecost, which means that God gives the Spirit at specific times for specific purposes. Now, after this sermon, look out for what God wants you to do and do it. Look out for what God wants to do and you do it. In conclusion, on this Pentecost Sunday, we want to ask ourselves three questions. Number one, where is the spirit calling the church? 
Number two, where is the Spirit calling each one of us? Because there is a mission and there is a purpose for which we exist. And then lastly, how willing am I to be open to the calling of the Spirit? May God bless you, brothers and sisters, as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday.